So this setup that you're seeing is what we had to do to get 3090s and SLI functional this early in the game. 3090s and SLI turns out not so simple to set up right now. There's a number of various issues we ran into, like the SLI fingers on the cards not lining up. It's not standardized, so they're in slightly different places on different boards, and not just vertically this time either, but also horizontally on the board. And also, the limitations for SLI these days are more strict than ever as NVIDIA has officially dropped SLI support going forward. And so now only things with explicit multi-GPU support or MGPU support will actually run two cards. And we had trouble running some of these games that don't technically require a bridge without a bridge. We had to get the SLI bridge in there in order to get it all working. But it's there, and we'll have some 3090 SLI benchmarks today for the highest performing possible gaming setup, but one which is also not at all worth the money, but we'll talk about that. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Team T-Force Cardea Ceramic C440 M.2 SSD, available in one terabyte and two terabyte capacities with PCIe Gen 4 support for high transfer speeds. Team claims that its SSD can do sequential speeds up to five gigabytes per second read and 4.4 gigabytes per second write, or 750,000 IOPS for random reads and writes. Team rates its SSD for 3,600 total terabytes written, and the ceramic heat spreader directly conducts from the controller to help manage SSD temperatures under high loads. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first of all, if you're not aware, the 3080s do not have SLI support. NVIDIA has continually, generation after generation, moved multi-GPU support, at least via a bridge, higher and higher up in its chain. And now it's at the very top in what NVIDIA has itself called a Titan class card and uh, not available in the flagship gaming card. NVIDIA also has publicly announced that it's moving away from SLI support and supporting SLI profiles as a first party and is putting all of that requirement onto the game developers if they want to support it, which basically condemns it to death at this point if you like multi-GPU, unfortunately. But there's still functionality in Vulkan and DirectX 12 games that have MGPU. We'll read that list to you now. It's pretty short. So official support, as stated by NVIDIA, includes Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Civ 6, Sniper Elite 4, Gears of War 4, Ashes, uh, Strange Brigade, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Zombie Army, Hitman 1, Deus Ex, Battlefield 1, and Halo Wars 2. And then for Vulcan, it's Red Dead 2, Quake 2 RTX, Ashes again, Strange Brigade again, and Zombie Army again. Now, of course, some of these games we've even heard of, and so it's worth giving a shot at testing SLI with these. Today, we're going to be talking about the power consumption for the total system. We'll talk about the two cards and the power consumption for that. This is something that, realistically, you shouldn't be doing for gaming. Maybe it makes sense to get multiple 3090s for some type of professional workload or for tile-based rendering, but a lot of those instances you don't need a bridge. Like if you're doing tile-based rendering in Blender, a bridge doesn't help you. They both render their own tile discreetly. There's no interaction between the GPUs that's worth speaking of. Uh, there's no AFR or anything like that. So typically with, with SLI, you'd be dealing with AFR and you don't necessarily want to send stuff through the PCIe bus, but over time, NVIDIA and AMD both have moved more towards trying to leverage MGPU, explicit multi-GPU, communication through PCIe. It's just been really slow to pick up, and over time, it's actually ended up decaying in adoption rather than increasing. Uh, all right, so we need to walk through the setup because it's absolutely insane, and then we'll go through gaming numbers and through some uh, power discussion as well. So the ridiculous setup that we did for this is right here. Basically, I had to get two test benches together next to each other because the SLI fingers on the Founders Edition card and the EVGA card are actually in different spots. So if we move my memory fan here, you'll see that on the board, this is positioned much further towards the slot on the EVGA card than it is on the FE, which means that it is not possible without risers to put these two in SLI. So at least on like these two cards, you'll need like for like. I think Asus and MSI might move them around a little bit too. So really frustrating that that's not standardized. But my solution was to run PCIe risers. So there's a riser in each slot. They're running to this test bench, and then they're mounted in this test bench's uh, vertical supports for the EVGA card. This one, though, since I couldn't align it like that, I shoved a piece of cardboard under it to support it, and then just positioned it horizontally uh, how I needed to. And I've got a couple of things like these clamps in place to support the cards. For memory cooling, because there's memory on Remember the back of the card as well. That's a major problem for this. I put this, I think, I don't know if it's a 2000 or 
3,000 RPM. Put this 3,000 RPM knock to a server fan on top of the car, it's blowing down. So that's feeding air into the 3090 FTW3 for the GPU, so that's fine. This GPU is plenty cool because it's got a hideously configured water cooling setup on it. Let me move these fans to show you. And then the fans are cooling the VRM and the memory, and it's, it's at this point basically below what stock would be. So the card, despite looking like this, is performing better than stock, which means that in a, the purest sense of uh, like for like comparisons, this obviously is not one because we're boosting the GPU a little higher by having this water block on it, but they're ultimately going to be restricted to the slowest of the two cards anyway, and you're talking a couple percent differences, so it doesn't matter. So this water block I secured, we'll show this in a separate probably Rip J video or something, but I secured it by taking a uh, nut and bolt and running it through a heat killer water block, except the problem is uh, there's no official mounting for this, and I didn't have anything to actually brace against the block. So I took some PCIe slot covers and I cut them with uh, metal snips and then I drilled a hole into the slot holes to make a bigger space for the nut and bolt to go through. And then this one down here is actually an NZXT Manta PCIe or rear IO whatever cover. So that's how it's secured to the GPU. Uh, and then like I said three fans for cooling memory and the VRM. So those are completely fine. This is hideous and terrible and everything, but it works perfectly. So that's an upside. And then for water cooling, I just hooked it up to a 240 rad. We have this kind of floating in the office now. It's a complete loop and it can just be hooked into any device on a whim. So uh, it's got two ID cooling reject pastel pink fans on it. I think these are a couple thousand RPM. So they're, they're actually pretty good for this. And then we have a small pump and res uh, alpha cool radiator. It's one of the thicker radiators. So it's not complete overkill. But the, the reason this is set up the way it is is because I was having even more difficulty lining these two cards up with the FE cooler on the 3090 FE. And so in order to get them lined up really well, uh, it was just easier to take the whole thing apart and do this instead. Believe it or not, that was actually, in fact, easier to do. So then we kind of position this one in here like that. That blows air in between the two cards, gets the back side of the memory, gets the VRM on the right side and then we're, we're good for cooling. In terms of the rest of the configuration, so test bench is on this bench platform, risers run to this bench platform, and they're butted against each other, so it takes a lot of space just for this. Uh, and then for the fans, I've got them plugged into this fan controller because they were, uh, some of the, the stuff over here was too far away to reach that bench. And we turn it all on, it's very loud and very annoying. And that's the system running and everything works. And the SLI bridge, this fan is so dangerous. The SLI bridge is right there. So uh, you can see again that the, the link's not aligned. And so I had to do all this stuff just to align it. Now this is PCIe Gen 3, but that didn't really matter in our testing previously. Uh, however, it is a riser. Between those two things, I'd expect maybe one to 3% offset for performance versus if it were slotted. So we're going to see bigger differences, though, offset by having a water cooler on it. End of the day, we're within a couple percentage points of what it would be in a real world setup if you could even do such a setup. OK, and then if we open GPU-Z on the system, we do have two different GPUs. So down here, you can see there are two. And I've got one showing on each feed. Uh, so like, for example, this one is reading 30 degrees Celsius or so. This one's reading about 24. I think that's the water cooled one. Uh, this does not show memory or VRM temperatures, but those are both fine. We checked it externally and they're not even close to TJ Maxx. So everything's working. And then uh, if you go into control panel for NVIDIA, this over here. the control panel and configure SLI has the maximize SLI performance option. It does not have this without the bridge. And then it's got both cards detected and then for MGPU games, we actually had issues getting them to work without a bridge because it just it wouldn't run both cards. I don't know if that's an NVIDIA thing or what, but it works now with the bridge connected. So before we get into the game benchmarking, I'm going to run Port Royal. Port Royal definitely works with this. This is the application Jay is doing the RIPGN series with, so we're going to respond with a RIPJ. This content is not meant to respond to him. It's an SLI benchmark, but I figure we'll just go ahead and get one of these benchmarks in 
while we have it all set up and uh, give Jay uh, give give Jay something to do. So that's the end of the Port Royal run. Uh, Twenty six thousand two fifty seven. I think Jay's current score is like I don't know fourteen thousand five hundred or something. So Jay, off to you, I guess. I'll probably respond with a single card anyway, and do some more extreme overclocking with it. But for now, this is this is not even overclocked. I've not touched precision. Haven't done anything. We just plugged the cards in and ran them. So this is like as I was about to say zero effort overclock, but you saw the bench. So maybe not quite zero, but I haven't done any actual uh, effort on it. Uh, so it's a pretty good starting point. All right, that's enough of that. Let's get into the gaming benchmarks. We'll start with the one with the most exciting of the gains, but the least exciting as a game. Strange Brigade is one of the better optimized games out there and also supports explicit multi-GPU. And it's also extremely popular, with an average of 33 players at any point in all of August. There are nearly as many players in Strange Brigade as Linus has employees, so we know that this game is well-loved by gamers in the community. Starting with 4K and Vulkan, the RTX 3090 SLI configuration ran 363 FPS average, with lows also scaling well. We didn't have any micro stutter issues and measured 243 and 233 FPS for the lows. That's an improvement of 93% over the 3090 FE stock card, bearing in mind that we've also improved the cooling of the 3090 FE, and so we'll gain maybe 1-3% to performance from those changes. Either way though, north of 90% is good scaling and that's what has made SLI so appealing for enthusiasts in the past. But this game is an exception, not the norm, and Nvidia's abandonment of SLI profiles going forward only further reduces the chance of this being worthwhile ever. At 1440p, the chart scale had to be adjusted yet again. Sorry that these are even less legible than normally, but having one item at 472 FPS average blows out the scale. This is versus a single RTX 3090, where the improvement is about 70%. We started to become bound by other factors towards the top end of that scale, but it's still better scaling than we've seen in a lot of games previously. Lows aren't improving proportionately to the average, but we also aren't seeing micro stuttering or game breaking issues. At 1080p, it's clear that we're bottlenecked by the CPU. We already mostly were, but now it's evident. In the very least, this proves to us that this particular application has a lot more room for a single card benchmarking. We'll quickly look at DX12 for Strange Brigade as well. At 4K, we ran 319 FPS average here, so the frame rate is lower than with Vulkan, but the scaling is technically better. With DX12, performance climbed by 98% over the single 3090 FE stock card. At 1440p, frame rate was 390 FPS average, so that's a 41% uplift. We're bouncing off the CPU limit again, which we saw in 1080p testing, but it's not worth showing another bottleneck Strange Brigade chart, so let's move on to a game people have actually played. Red Dead Redemption 2 is next. Starting with Vulkan for this one, the RTX 3090 SLI configuration had about 50% uplift at 155 FPS average versus 104 FPS average for a single card configuration. We did not observe any micro stutter or other AFR issues during our test passes. The uplift isn't anywhere near what Strange Brigade was offering, with its 98% uplift, but it's something. It, it's, there is something there. 50% for an extra $1,500, though, is hard to really care about, especially considering NVIDIA is putting future SLI support on game developers, so it's basically doomed anyway. At 1440p, the 3090 SLI configuration maxes out at 175 FPS average, just a 17% uplift over the single card. We're becoming bound here. We won't bother with 1080p for the same reasons as before, because they were equal due to the bottlenecking. And just as a notice, SLI for these cards does not work in Red Dead with DirectX 12. In this chart, that's clear. The cards are even, and the SLI config technically dropped a few frames occasionally from other potential issues in the test setup, but we can't imagine what those might possibly be considering how sound the setup was. Hitman is apparently supported, but Hitman 2 does not seem to be supported. The SLI and non-SLI performance was about the same, so there's no scaling to speak of, and we'll have to move along from this one and express our great disappointment and lengthy pros at another time that we can't play Hitman 2 with SLI. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider, testing positioned the SLI RTX 3090 is at 167 FPS average, with lows also getting uplifted from the second card. Improvement versus a single card was about 60% here, and for future reference, we've observed a CPU limitation of this game as becoming imposed around the 180 FPS marker. 
so there's still some room to scale on the CPU. SLI improvement is just limited overall for this title, although it gets credit for at least being present. It certainly isn't worth $1,500 for a second card, though. At 1440p, the scaling dies and performance stops increasing. Maybe this is the scenario where NVIDIA's fabled single-card 8K gaming could actually be a reality, except for the part where it takes two cards. But this is starting to look like uh, almost everything except 4K and higher would be limited by an SLI 3090 setup to really no one's surprise. It's just, again, the limited list of games and the lack of future official support from NVIDIA on SLI makes it tough to justify for things outside of workstation applications. Quake 2 RTX is last. This is on Vulkan and is fully path traced, making it an interesting title for determining performance scaling for the new RT cores, but we talked about that in the review previously. At 4K, the frame rate ran 67 FPS average an improvement of 70.5% over the RTX 3090 single card, but with no improvements in the 0.1% lows. This isn't as much scaling as we've seen elsewhere, but it's still better than Tomb Raider and Red Dead. We didn't visually see any severe micro stuttering, but the lows are also not anywhere near where we'd like to see them for this title. 1440p had the SLI configuration at 137 FPS average, with 0.1% lows dipping below the single card. That's a 62% improvement over one card at 1440p. Finally, at 1080p, we saw a 216 FPS average, with lows below the single card level once again. 216 has the SLI configuration about 53% over the single card. If you want to revive a competitive Quake career, but with RTX enabled, this would help do it. So for power consumption, we didn't make new charts for this, but we'll pop up one of the Firmark charts from our 3090 review, and you can see single card power consumption here, multi-card, is just gonna scale linearly because this is only one card. This number does not show total system power draw. So you can just increase this uh, exactly linearly, multiply it for how many cards you have. Assuming all are under the same workload, it will scale. So if you have a 500 watt draw or a 400 watt draw, it'll be 1,000 or 800 watts for just the cards. For total system power consumption, just for fun, we tested that system that now needs two test benches to run. And total system was 360 watts idle and uh, and uh, it was 941 watts total system under a Port Royal load. So that bench is not our competitive overclocking bench. It's only, uh, only in, in air quotes here, 10700K. It's at 5.1 gigahertz. That's fine for GPU reviews. The reason we use a 10.7 is because we don't need it for other things. But for competitive overclocking, we use a 10.9KF or something like that. So your power consumption may go up in a scenario like that. But uh, just shy of 1,000 watts is, is quite a high power consumption. And most of that's GPU because that was in a Port Royal workload. So that's it for the testing. Obviously, this was done because we could, because it's interesting, it's fun, interesting to see how the stuff scales. Unfortunately, multi-GPU is all but dead at this point, and uh, there's a lot of appeal to it. Even NVIDIA and AMD can see appeal because they sell more cards to the same people, even if you're able to beat the higher-end card with two lower-end ones. Uh, but uh, the, the support is just lacking, and supporting games and drivers has been questionable at best. A lot of the times, the best support has come through community-made profiles, and uh, then, I mean, this is not, not a great system to have to rely on community for stuff like that. So it was an interesting test, but this is not a configuration we'd recommend, obviously, for gaming. Because you're limited to that list of games we read earlier, and that's about it. Uh, NVIDIA has the official list on its website if you're curious. Again, a lot of these games, if not all of them, uh, a good amount of them should work through the PCIe slot. We were having trouble getting that working for some reason. Not really sure why. But with the bridge, it did work, and we were able to enable uh, SLI and run it in the games as expected. So Strange Brigade, 100% scaling is pretty, pretty neat. 98% with DX12, 93 or so with uh, Vulcan. But that's about the best we saw. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.